And I just want to say, Frank, as you come, thank you for your yes. And um, I, I'm not going to say anything because this is his story to share. But the very fact that he's here and he's willing to take this mic down and share his story, um, it's, it's not about him. It's about him. And so today, though you'll hear Frank's story, you're going to hear that Frank's going to give God the glory. And my prayer is that you would be blessed as a result of what he's endured, but what God has brought him through as well. Amen. Frank, we bless you and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Pastor Jonathan, for this opportunity. Um, yeah, it is a little bit uh, difficult for me to share this, I guess, in a public space. Although I've shared it multiple times over with many people in, in my business uh, uh, you know, uh, sphere of influence and family members, neighbors, because what I went through was actually a physical thing and you could actually see it. It's not something you can secretly hide. And a lot of us struggle with many issues, mental, relationship, financial, you know, put on that list, it's a long list. And many of us are struggling with many issues. But uh, as the pastor shared, I've been in this church as a child at a different location, but we came here. I grew up in the church, uh, third generation Pentecostal from Italy, uh, know the Bible, went through my, my time as a young person that uh, challenged a lot of what my parents taught me maybe was rebellious, maybe had indiscretions that I care not to share, but the Lord delivered me from that. I recognized who he was, and all the seeds that were planted by many Sunday school teachers and pastors that were from that time in my life, from my young youth till now, all that produced strength for me to go through what I went through. So, by the way, it's good to find a church if you don't have a church. And people that pray intercessory, okay, like this church. My mother was a prayer warrior. My wife was a solid helpmate during this experience. So those are all positives. And I'm saying if you don't have some of them, then go through that list, find a good church, connect, find a helpmate, connect, because that's what God wants us to do. That's what God wants us to do. So I'm going to share the Word of God because I wanted to put in the context of what my testimony, Okay. So the verses I'm going to share are on suffering, perseverance, and victory. Okay? You know, if, you don't, if, you, if you've been involved in athletic um, games or sports or competition, you need to struggle to win. Okay? And actually, it's better if you struggle and you win. That's the reward. What, do you want to just sit and have the accolades and the trophies and the ribbons just put upon you with no effort? Okay? There's a little bit on our part. We should not be afraid to go in the theater of this competition. Now, excuse me if I drink water once in a while, because unfortunately, with all the radiation I had on my face... I still have after effects, and it affects my mouth. So, Brian, if you could uh, put up uh, Romans verse, chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. Now focus on the words, please, that I, I'm going to share with you after I read these verses. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have gained access by faith, as the brother shared this morning, 
into his grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. How do you achieve that hope? Well, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Wow. Glory in our sufferings. You got that list in your head? Pick it. Title it in your head. What's your problem? You're suffering. Okay? But you need to be glory in it. Is that... Is that I don't know. I don't know. That seems weird. But this is where we're going with this. Because this is scriptural. Because we know that suffering... Listen to this. Produces perseverance. Okay? Perseverance. Character. You want to be a champ? You want to have character? You need to go through a fight. Okay? You can't stand down from it. And character, hope. You want to know where you're going in life? Do you want to know after everything's said and done, you take your last breath? Where's your hope? Where's your hope? The hope is in what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. Okay? And hope does not put us to shame because God loves, love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. James 1, verses 2 to 4. Again, on that theme, is it up? Consider it pure joy. Wow. Glory and joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produce perseverance. There's that word again. You want to get through life? You want to be, have that perseverance and that strength and never giving up? You need to go through the difficulties in life. Let perseverance finish its work. See, that's another thing. A lot of people suck out. The challenge comes and they give up. That's not what God wants us to do. Okay? God wants us to continue in his faith and belief that he will give you the victory. Even though it looks like it's done. Yes. Let the perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. So, suffering, trials, temptations, faith, perseverance, character, and finally, hope. As a Christian, you've signed up for this. You didn't sign up for feeling good on Sunday morning. Okay? You've signed up for a battle where the enemy wants to take your soul and bring your soul with him in the bottomless pit of hell. That's not what God wants us to go through, okay? And to seek God's face in your circumstance will bring you there. Don't think that sometimes these trials, these temptations, the suffering, the sickness. Oh, what did I do? God is beating me up. Read Job. Read how God allowed the enemy to bring suffering Disappointment, loss in Job's life. Job's life. Now, if you do something that brings upon that problem in your life, repent and change. 
But if you're just walking happily along, like I was, and you get a big slap in the face, like I got, and then you have to question things, I tell you, all those years of growing up in the church, reading the Word of God, and having my own experiences prepared me for this problem that came in my life. It prepared me. So don't be discouraged if you have these problems. Whatever they are, God is with you. Okay? September of 2022, I noticed a growth in my nasal passage here. It was inside my nasal. It wasn't outside. It wasn't visible. And I just, during COVID, I just thought, you know, congestion, inflammation. I thought it was just a bump. I went to go visit the doctor. That was hard because to get appointments was very difficult at that time with COVID. They wanted to do all this stuff on, uh, on the computer, but really someone had to actually see what was going on. Uh, I went, to the, I went to the doctor's appointment, and uh, they felt it was a, a cyst in my nose. I thought, okay. I, I thought it was, anyways. It was the size of a pea in my nose. And, uh, you know, they, they set me up for a, a CAT scan, and uh, um, that CAT scan came was, was, was uh, later on uh, in September. And again, uh, with the evidence of the CAT scan, they were still leaning on that it was a cyst in my nose. Uh, I felt, okay, well, it kind of still kept growing, and it grew a little bit bigger than a pea at that point. And, but it was always inside. It wasn't visible outside. It was, like, affecting my breathing, too. And uh, they set me up in queue for an operation, and I said, when? Uh, they said, well, you know, it's not cancer. <laughs> That's what the doctor told me. So we're dealing with all the, the serious issues, I guess, in treating people that need to be treated. Uh, time passes, November rolls around, and uh, my nose starts bleeding quite often, and I'm having a hard time to, to sleep at night and uh, for the breathing, and also just the automatic bleeding in my nose, which was very difficult socially because I, I could not go out, uh, you know, and just sit there and eat with people and talk with people, and then all of a sudden my nose starts bleeding. So that was an issue for me. But uh, thank God, I didn't think it was an issue of great magnitude. And, you know, I complained, and as much as I complained, they moved me up for January the 3rd, when I had my first uh, operation where they were going to remove the cyst, which they believe that was the case in my, in my nasal, on my right side. And uh, upon uh, re removal, the, the, the operation went well, because my wife told me, oh, it went well, but the doctor said uh, they weren't sure that it was a cyst, they wanted to get it tested. Well, you know when the doctor says he wants to get it tested, uh, Okay, but then again, I wasn't too concerned about it because it wasn't affecting anywhere else in my body. Thank God, it was local. And uh, the doctor uh, called me very quickly on that week. I think uh, within two days, I had results. I went to, obviously when he called me in, in two days, I kind of knew that uh, it was a lot more than, than what we thought. So he says, you got cancer. And I'm going to send you over to Sunnybrook, and we're going to deal with, uh, with, the, uh, with the issue at Sunnybrook. They're very well equipped to do the job. And by the way, if anybody here is in the medical field, like a doctor, uh, or studying to be a doctor, or studying to be a nurse, we need Christian practitioners filled with the Holy Spirit. Because I tell you, you could be used very effectively in the hospital. Because uh, I spent a lot of time in the hospital, and I knew the nurses that were filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Because when they came to deal with me, I could sense it, and they, they prayed for me. And, and, and that's a, a time that you can be used. Okay? 
So the, the, I think the, the Bible does talk about uh, giftings of people, and uh, part of that is healing, okay? God can use doctors and nurses to heal us. It's not only through prayer, but through healing through medical arts, which God gives the wisdom and the understanding for it. On February the 9th was my first operation. And you have to remember at this time, my son Joshua and my daughter-in-law Lisa, they were preparing themselves to get married. So here we go. I'm going to have this operation on my face. And their, their wedding was on the 18th. I'm having this operation on the 9th. It's nine days. They're going to cut my face. The doctor said to me, Dr. Higgins, he said to me, listen, the way the cancer is located on your face, we recommend that we also remove 13 lymph nodes from your neck to its surveillance to make sure that the, the cancer did not find its way through my lymph nodes and also uh, it was a way of preventing the disease if it does move through the rest of my body, okay? That meant they cut my throat from here to here. That operation, they cut my nose like this. They went like that. They removed the tumor. They cut my ear took the cartilage in my ear, rebuilt my bridge, put my nose back. You know what, they did a wonderful job because those of you who saw me later after that, they did a fabulous job. So I was thinking, wow, Lord, you're good, but I've got all this. I'm gonna look like Frankenstein going to my son's wedding, you know? But I put on a scarf and everything else, and I tried to do the best to, to, to think. And you know what? I was in the hospital up to February the 11th at Sunnybrook. That was a Saturday. The following Saturday, I was at my son's wedding from 10 o'clock in the morning at the church to 2 o'clock at night enjoying the, the service of watching my son and my daughter-in-law get married and eating the food and enjoying people's company and having a dance with my wife too, you know? I don't think the enemy liked that too much because, you know, in that time, let me tell you something. You know what the enemy wants you to do? He wants you to hide in the closet in a fetal position, weeping and crying of your circumstance. No, you need to challenge. And sometimes the Holy Spirit puts that upon you. And I'll share one testimony, well, one example, in the hospital. When I had that operation, I was in the recovery room during that time. I laid in bed. I was uh, medicated, you know, with all the painkillers you want to call that are out there, okay? Obviously because of the traumatic operation I had. And I laid in bed there. And there's probably about 14 to 15 people in the area. And you have all the, the, the nurses that operate and they're observing to make sure that everybody gets out of there and, get, and moves on either to a different bed in the hospital if they have to stay longer, or go home. In my case, it was going home. While I was there in the hospital bed, and I was laying, I can't remember if it was the second night, the first night, can't really remember. It might have been the first night. There was a, a young woman next to my bed, which I didn't know, because they have these curtains wrapped around, and you don't know who you are there. All you hear is a lot of this. Uh, uh, crying and screaming and, and just people complaining about their physical situation 
whatever operation they had during that time in the operation theater room. And this woman kept crying and crying and and she kept saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. But she didn't, wasn't really saying to Jesus what she wanted. She was just saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And nurses were getting around her. And they were trying to, because you hear everything, all the talking. And they were trying to calm her down. And they, and they told her, listen, we've given you the medication. We've given you everything. And then they brought in someone, a psychiatrist, to try to, a counselor, a psychiatrist, I guess a psychiatrist in her book. And that, that gentleman was trying to calm her down. It wouldn't, it wouldn't. And I was sitting there, listening to that. You know what the Holy Spirit was saying to me? Pray for her. That's what he said. He was saying to me, pray for the person next to you. And I'm sitting there, lying down in the bed like this. I said, Lord, I'm going to pray for this person? Look at me. <laughs> Look what I just went through. And it was like a, a nudge. You know, like when someone nudges you? Do it. Do it. Time passed during that evening. And I allowed myself to, to talk. So I said to the, person, the patient next to me, I said to her, listen, ma'am, um, I've been hearing you complaining a lot this evening. And I know you're in pain. And I know you're calling out to Jesus. Are you a Christian? Okay, so she said she was. I'm not going to judge her, right? I said, uh, you're in a good place here. You had a problem. You had all these doctors and nurses minister to your condition. Now it's time for your body to heal. So you're in a safe place. Yeah, but I'm, I'm a, she was having panic attacks and anxiety. So I said to her, well, when you say, Jesus, Jesus, why don't you, I'm going to pray for you, but why don't you do this? Why don't you say, God, you're good. God, you are great. God, you're my protector and my provider. And when the anxiety and the panic attack takes control over you, call for the blood of Jesus. Say, Lord, cover me with your blood. The, built, the blood that you spilt on Calvary 2,000 years ago. And then I prayed for her. You know what happened? She calmed down. Do you know there was a bunch of nurses that came while I was in bed later on? Oh, thank you. Are you a pastor? Did you? Thank you for your... So I'm just saying, we are ministers in every circumstance. Okay? Believe it or not, even when you are like down and out, like a boxer, knocked out on the floor, and the ref is counting, one, two, three. You know what? God could still use you there. Okay? God could still use you there. So, you know, that, that was a strange experience, but that actually happened at that time. I went to my son's wedding, and it was good. It was joyful. But then started the treatment for, my, for, for this condition. They recommended radiation. I had 33 sessions of radiation from March the 14th to, to April of 28. I had 33 sessions of radiation on my face, which I still have after effects. That was very hard for me because the radiation was a place where they had to strap my face and my body down on a table, which I'm claustrophobic. So I had this mask on my face pushing me down all the way here, my chin and my shoulder, and I had to lay on a table 
and they would zap me for about, uh, I believe the whole process is about 10 to 12 minutes. And, but they allowed me to play music. And there was a special song, a worship song from Vineyard, that, uh, that, I, that really touched my heart. There was words in there that the Lord was using, scriptural verses that was used to give me healing and the hope in my life going through this experience. Because uh, this experience was very difficult for me in the sense that I think all of us are going to meet our God. And it's a time and it's, it's an issue. It's a, it's a process. All of us will have our physical challenges one day. But I can tell you, God will be there with us. He will be there supernaturally with us. Words of, of, from the scripture, music that uplifts God, and in your experience, these are the things that get you through the battle at the battlefield, okay? That was very difficult for me, but it, what it did is it damaged a lot of my nasal passages. I could not breathe where the, where the cancer was on this side of my face. It fused together inside all my sinuses, and my nasal. On this side, because of the radiation, it damaged a lot of my breathing on this side of my, my face to about 25 to 30% of breathing. So here we go. Those of you that have understanding about radiation and the burning, my mouth was all dry, which I could not eat food, certain foods. They would irritate my mouth. Even drinking was hard, and I couldn't breathe. I was lucky if I could sleep 25 to 30 minutes a day. I would literally, in that situation, say to God, what am I even here? <laughs> Why am I on this earth where I can't even eat, I can't even breathe, I can't even drink. And by the way, when I could eat, I could not breathe. Because when you eat, you breathe through your nose. I had to quickly take small bites and figure a way to chew and breathe at the same time. I found myself many, many times in the middle of the night, two, three, four o'clock in the morning, outside, literally in my short pants, really my underwear, in a gazebo I have in the back, praying to God. I would go out there praying for my situation, and then God would impress on me to pray for others. And I would say to the Lord, Lord, I need deliverance. What? Pray. He would just tell me, pray. Again, we're getting back to this thing. The enemy wants you out. He doesn't want you worshiping him. He doesn't want you thanking him. What was the word? Glory in your suffering. Glory in your suffering. I wasn't glorying, but supernaturally, used by the Holy Spirit, I was. Physically, no. Physically in my own flesh, no. But when God took control of my situation, where I felt like giving up, the Lord gave me an anointing. And I was able to get through that. Okay? After all the radiation and the treatment, I thought, okay, we're going to the place of healing healing. My body will get over the trauma and the radiation, and I'm going to go get this healing, which takes time, 
And I prayed, Lord, give me the healing. Lord, give me the healing. Because there's lots of times I would pray for the miracle. And I came to the front here. And the, and the pastor did anoint me with oil. And many people interceded and prayed for me. I didn't get the miracle. I had to go through the suffering. I don't know why the Lord chose this route for me. But I, I know deep down, I made a decision not to be bitter, angry, or resentful in this whole process. August the 29th last year, on the, at Sunnybrook, as the healing was, I thought the healing was going, okay? I could, I could find myself breathing a little bit better, but still I had reduction because we talked about doing a, 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 a treatment that they would go inside again, put a tube on this side of my face so that I could breathe, okay? That was the idea, but they felt this whole area had to heal before they would do that process. Upon review, the doctor looked at me and he saw, I thought it was just, to be honest with you, I thought it was scar tissue, okay? Because I, I saw the bump sort of coming, but my face had changed so many times, the swelling, it would go down, go up and down, including my nose. And I thought that area, the, the swelling was just scar tissue. When the doctor looked at it, he said, I'm gonna do a biopsy today for this. I didn't even go for that. It was just a routine review. I'm gonna do a biopsy because this doesn't look good. It looks like the cancer came again in the same area. So here I am, <laughs> you know, when this, when this doctor said this to me, I said, wow, I went through all this, all the radiation, Lord, I prayed to you. Many people have been praying for me. And now I've got this problem manifesting itself once again. You know how easy it is to have no hope? Okay? They told me no chemo, no radiation. Can't do it. You, your face took too much. Chemo is not going to work. And they can't do the operation on my nose again. So they told me, the doctor told me, listen, the only alternative we have is we have to remove your nose. Okay? That was hard. That was hard to accept. But uh, a part of me, I want to live. I did. I want God to heal me. Okay? I wanted the miracle. I didn't get the miracle, and I thought I was getting the healing. I didn't get the healing, but I kept going. I kept believing that God was going to take control of the situation, even though it seemed negative, quite negative. So on October, October the 6th, October the 6th was my operation where they removed my nose. So I had my nose removed, and it's been over a year, and I saw quite a bit. I had two grandkids born during that time, one in December last year, another one in March, and I got five. Okay, I don't have the nose, but I always tell the, I make a joke with my kids there, I said, you know what? Because in an Italian culture, there's a trick where you pull your nose off and say, hey, I got your nose. Watch out. I said, now I could do a nice one for them. I could pull my nose off, freak them out, and say, hey, if you don't listen to your mom and dad, this is what happens. And they're saying, you are outrageous. Okay? But I went through it. I went through it, and I accepted it. It was very hard for me and very hard for my wife, too because she's getting bombarded and she can't do nothing. I know, if, you, if you're a helpmate in, in, in a relationship, you kind of wonder, what can you do? Can you write a check and figure this thing out and you know, solve it? Can you just do an, an errand or, 
I don't know, say some nice words, pray, that's good. There's many times I just felt alone. But God was there. God was there in that situation. That was very traumatic. I remember the first time I looked at my, my face after all the gauze was removed and I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, you know what I said? I didn't say, wow, this is like, what happened, Frank? No. You know what the first thing that clicked in my head when I looked at myself? I said, Lord, 2,000 years ago, you were beaten up. Your face was beaten to a pulp. You were whipped and bruised beyond recognition on your face and your body. I looked at my face. It literally looked like I was beaten to a pulp. And you know, you know what? Even in that situation, I felt like the pain and suffering and the beating I took is this much compared to what you did for me. What you did for me, Lord. I thank God that he gave me the ability to go through this situation. Still not over. Because there's a new normal for me. The new normal was, I didn't even have, I have a prosthetic now. This computer generated, it's my nose. It's a Hollywood nose, number one. Okay? As a matter of fact, I could change my nose anytime I want if I choose to, to have a different look, you know? But this is my natural look, computer generated, 3D printer. Okay? And it's a process, it's a new way of doing things. But after, that ther after the, the trauma of that, that final operation, the doctors then recommended that I go into a chamber, hyperbaric oxygen therapy chamber. I don't know if you're familiar with this. It's a tube. I call it a glass coffin. That's what it was. Because a person like me going in there, I had less than uh, maybe two, two and a half inches where my shoulder would touch. You can't reach. My face was only like this. I have claustrophobic, I am claustrophobic and I got to go and spend two hours in that chamber. What am I going to do in there for two hours? I would say to myself, my wife kept, thank God she stayed in the chamber, in the room or the space, but she was outside. I was in. Nobody, think about it. Oh, go sit in the coffin. I'm just outside. I'm going to close the door. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Would you do it? Because that's how I felt. And my wife was encouraging me to go in there and the nurses, but it was very hard for me to go in that chamber. And then I felt, what am I going to do there for two hours? What am I going to think about? What am I? Because all I could think about was, I want to get out of here. But the oxygen therapy, it's not harmful. It's actually very good. It, it produces stem cell growth. It, 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 it juices your, your blood flow. It, it, it juices your immune system. Okay? It brings a lot of healing in your body. You feel like you're 42 feet below sea level with pure oxygen for two hours. That's the science behind it. And it did work. It helped my face. It helped my face from the radiation. Help my face from all the trauma from the operation. But I was able to, because they got a, a, a screen and you have a speaker in there and you could listen and watch anything. Well, I went to church every day for five days. Okay, and different people online, you know. Uh, obviously, I couldn't listen to you because I would listen to you on Sunday anyway, but, you know, like, I'm not going to listen to your message for five days in a row. So I had to find other 
you know, pastors to share the message. And they was coming. You know what I felt? 40 days. I'm not, I'm not equating my experience to Jesus Christ. But Jesus was, was 40 days in the desert. I was 40 days there. And I was empowered by God, by the word of God, listening to it to encourage it. Now, the first couple of times I went through, I had some issues with the panic. And then the Lord said to me, stop thinking about your problem. Okay? That's what the enemy wants. He wants you to think about your problems all the time. Okay? God told Adam and Eve to do two things. Be fruitful and multiply. Not to sit home or wherever and think about your problems and think it's the end of the world. Be productive with your time. Okay? Be fruitful. Find someone. Find someone. Get married if you can. Okay? If you have the gifting of not get, being married, that's okay too. But be fruitful and multiply. Okay? Spend the time with God. I have overcame that situation by the fact of, of just not focusing on my situation for praying for others and listening to the word of God. It's like God took me and says, sit down here. Don't move. Don't move. And listen, I'm going to minister to you. I'm going to heal you. Okay? Because there is a time for healing. For your mind and your body. Sit down. Take a deep breath. Relax. Don't hyper. Don't get nervous. Okay? That's what God did to me. So, after that experience was finished, that's it. Doctors did a scan on me. They said, you know, we're not going to do any more scans because we're doing every three months. You always come back negative with the MRIs and the thing. So you know what? We'll see you in December. I'll probably have a scan later on. But you know what? If God healed me there, why wouldn't he heal me in the future? I'm not going to be concerned about what the enemy is going to say. Because let me tell you, I learned a lot about reading doctor's reports because I saw them. I was so in think about these things, indeterminate, not, not visual, um, re really negative, negative reports. You know when you're reading a medical report and they come back negative like that? That's actually good, <laughs> right? That's good. So God is good. He's taking me in a different place this experience. I don't know why he did not bring me the miracle. I know he gave me the healing. I'm here. I'm here. I breathe. You hear that? I smell. I sneeze. I drink. And I eat. Okay? I drink and I eat. Now, I want to just share this one last thought with you. I'm going to share the song that touched my heart during this experience. But the song is, is, is about the banqueting table, okay? And in song, song of Solomon, it talks about sitting at the table. It's really a reference of the church and Christ, okay? Now... And his banner over me is love. Are you familiar with medieval, if not ancient times, when they used to fight at the battlefield? Okay, you've probably watched all these older movies, and not even older, some new movies, like The Gladiator, and, and maybe, uh, what's that gentleman, uh, Braveheart? There you go. So that's, that's English uh, uh, battle between the Scots and the, the Anglos. 
On the battlefield at that time, not today, but at that time, when soldiers would line up, and by the way, the Apostle Paul talks about this. He talks about being a Roman soldier. Helmet, shield, right? Wearing all the equipment, the sword, the word of the Lord. This is a fight, guys. Wake up. Your suffering, your temptation, your trial is a fight. That's what it really is. It manifests itself different ways. Sometimes the Lord allows the enemy. Sometimes it's our actions and our stupidity that allow a foothold for the enemy in our lives. Repent and change, okay? But we are truly in a battle. And that's how I felt I was in that experience. Okay, think of it in the battlefield. Think of a soldier and you're there and you're fighting and you're, you're general, God, Jesus Christ, they're the same, with a banner at the, at the, at the, the theater of war. The soldiers would see the banner from a distance and that's where they followed. They followed their leader in that direction. What would the enemy try to do? Take the banner away from your team. Okay? When soldiers are fighting here on earth, we are fighting here. It's not spiritual. This is physical. This operation, your mental issues, your financial issues, your relationship issues. This is the battle here on this earth. When those soldiers are fighting, and you're fighting your opponents, and you see the blood and the mayhem and the screaming of the battle, it is very easy to be discouraged and say, when is this fight going to be over? When? I just see blood, mayhem, and destruction. You know what God's telling you? Don't look here. Look at me. I'm carrying the banner. Go forward. Fight. And focus your abilities on following me. And don't focus, I don't have enough money in my bank account. The doctor said, whatever. Call it whatever you want. My husband or my wife, my son, my daughter, the co-worker at work, my boss, all those things are your battlefield on this earth. You're the focus on the banner that God is carrying, and it's called love. Once this battle's over and we leave this earth and the, the battle's complete, we're going to sit at the table with God. And you know what you do when you're a winner and you're a victor? You have a party. And Jesus says, I'm not going to drink this wine till you come with me in heaven. You abstain. Why? Because when we reach there, we will enjoy the feast with the Lord. Do you want to be at that table? Don't suck down from the battle. Don't get the enemy. The suffering is an opportunity for you to build perseverance and character and hope in your life. My Catholic brothers and sisters believe in purgatory, a place where your body goes, your soul, excuse me, and your brothers and your sisters pray for you to get to heaven. We don't believe that. Do you know what purgatory is? Here. This is where your soul gets purged. This is where you become gold. Okay? 
The fires and the difficulties purge your soul in preparation for you to sit at the table with the living God. Okay? You want to play that? Uh, and this is a song that really ministered to my soul during my radiation and also through the operation and still today. If you want, close your eyes and just meditate on the words and let the Lord minister to you. Get out of 